Hi everyone, this is Genev and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is an organization that was created to provide legal counsel and educational support um, and advocacy for comic book authors, publishers, distributors, sellers, and, um, and providers, which would include libraries and schools as well. So they do that sometimes by providing actual legal counsel in a court case. Um, you can see in the uh, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund case files some examples of that, and I've got some of those on the website. Um, they also provide a lot of educational materials and sponsor events like Bad Book Week um, to help raise awareness. Um, and they, the website itself is really great, so it's kind of I have to admit, it's a little bit odd to be doing a whole virtual seminar on the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund because the um, organization's website, I find, is so chock full of information. So I encourage everybody to go there and read firsthand a lot about what they do and take a look at some of the um, books that have been challenged, uh, some of which are on our reading list. I've also got that included on the website as well. But um, one of the things that I've done is I've, I've gone into the history of comic book censorship going back to the 1950s and the um, 1954 congressional hearing on juvenile delinquency in particular because that was really key. I mean, that was long before the comic book legal defense fund's time, but that was really kind of, I think, the start of a lot of trouble for comic books and it wasn't all unwarranted. I think that that's really important to keep in mind too that um, a lot of the crime and horror comics that were coming out at that time were things that at least when I look at them I certainly don't think that they would that they would be something that I would want to give to you know um, eight or nine or ten year old but kids were buying these things down at the corner store for 10 cents along with their penny candy. So it was widely available and we really didn't have um, a lot of um, control over who was reading what or who had access to what. And it's not that I, I believe in over censoring children either. Like I do believe that kids have intellectual rights as well. And it's not that I think that kids need to be shielded from all, um, all things gory or violent. Uh, but it's just kind of important to keep in mind that context when you're going through and looking at how comic books were censored back then, that um, there was, there certainly was um, a fair share of pearl clutching and over um, overstated paranoia over delinquency and really, um, you know, terrible connections being drawn to juvenile delinquency in comics that are not credible <laughs> but um, but that's really where it all began and I think that when the comic book legal defense fund was formed in the late 1980s um, a lot of it was in that post uh, comics code authority climate where comic book creators and publishers really had a, a better sense of how far things could go. So when comic book stores were raided in the 80s, one in particular um, called uh, Friendly Franks, um, when that was, when that raid happened, um, people weren't naive to how far that could go. And I think that that's why um, Dennis Kitchen and a number of other underground comic creators felt that they really had to do something um, that would be a little more long-standing to help uh, in the long fight <laughs> against censorship and comics. And I think comic books are particularly vulnerable um, just because it's easy to, um, I mean they're so visually stunning or shocking sometimes, and it's easy to single things out um, in them and take them out of context. And I think um, you know, Scott McLeod talks about this a little bit in his book about the legitimacy of comics and how they're still not recognized as a legitimate art form. So it's easy um, to target them, or it's easy for censors to target them, rather. So that's just a little bit about um, sort of the history, uh, which I have gone into quite a bit on the site. 
You will also see, um, I've tried to draw connections as I go to some of those cases and why the um, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund was formed, or, um, or even just what some of those early uh, censorship files have to say uh, or have to tell us about the dangers of not having appropriate legal counsel, especially when um, when you read about the 1954 congressional hearing on juvenile delinquency. Uh, William Gaines, who later did found uh, Mad Magazine, which is one of the magazines that I grew up with that I didn't even think of when we were doing our introductions to this course and our, our experiences with comic books. But uh, he he was the only one who actually appeared before the uh, Senate committee and he um, he really blew it. <laughs> he was hopped up on a lot of drugs apparently and um, was just pretty cocky in a lot of his testimony and so the censors won. And when I say the censors won, um, they didn't censor themselves or sorry, rather, um, it's the government didn't actually censor comic books, but it was through public pressure and um, and through publishers not wanting to um, to kind of dance that dance anymore, who decided to self censor through the Comics Code Authority. So again, if we're not willing to defend comics appropriately, and if we leave um, poor amphetamine riddled. Um, publishers like William Gaines to go and defend themselves in a court of law, um, really, really terrible things can happen. So please enjoy the site. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, just because like I said, there is quite a bit to go through. I've tried um, in the site, uh, just one more thing about some of the, the comic book images that are included. Um, I tried, I don't know if those are the exact issues that were rated from these stores. Um, but I just tried to kind of find titles. Um, they are the same uh, comic books, but as far as the issue goes, I just find, tried to find um, issues from around that same time period, just so you can kind of get a sense of what it was the cops were getting so mad about. So, and then the other, the last thing, and this is our discussion question for the week, or our discussion questions for the week. Um, I just want you to consider as you go through the site, what more libraries can do to help facilitate conversations that make people feel better about engaging. And maybe this is a little bit idealistic of me, but um, because I, I think a lot of people who want to censor um, texts and they want to uh, prevent other people from reading them are not always open to conversation. But this kind of comes from some bigger concerns that I've had um, as I've gone through this program about um, how we seem to be really be losing a sense of, I don't know what to call it, literary conversation or academic conversation around uh, text or expression in general. So I'm talking about, you know, specifically um, some of the conversations that have been running on the Chairing Stories Facebook page, which is Dr. DeVos's Facebook page. Um, that I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, there's a lot of conversation um, going on, not necessarily on the page, but just in general on social media about um, cultural appropriation, for example. So where I'm going with this is that it's really easy for me, for example, to consider that, um, you know, obscenity needs to be defended um, or that um, even some of the pornography cases um, need to be defended. Um, violence, horror, all of those things, but that's also because they don't bother me. But when I think of some of the conversations being had right now about cultural appropriation as an actual act of violence on a group of people, that's where I start to get a little bit, a little more unnerved from a censorship angle. So just try to think about that, kind of where are your limits for censorship? What would you be comfortable with and what would you not be comfortable with? Do you have any limits or do you really feel that anything should be fair game? Um, and how can libraries facilitate conversation around some of these more contentious pieces so that we can maybe try to channel um, some of that anger and um, censorship energy <laughs> into a more productive conversation? I'll frame that way better when I type it out, I'm sure. Hopefully, maybe not. 
Um, and then the other option, well, sorry, the other option, um, if you don't want to answer that question, is to um, take a look at the um, LIS 518 Challenge Readings page from the site because I've included three of our comic books that are cited on the Comic Book Legal Defense page as being challenged. And take a look at the corresponding page. All, everything is clickable. <coughs> Sorry. And let me know um, what you think of the challenge, first of all, and how you think the library handled it, and how you think, if it was a library, I mean, it might have been the publisher who was challenged, um, and what you think of how the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund uh, handled it. So how do you how do you feel about how everybody involved handled it? How about we just leave it at that? Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the site and I look forward to discussing the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund and censorship with all of you. Bye!